live from Toronto, Canada, it's theCUBE. Covering Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit 2018. Brought to you by theCUBE. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE live coverage of Toronto for the Blockchain Cloud Convergence Show. This is the Global Cloud Blockchain Summit, part of the Futurist event that's going on for the next two days after this. Our next guest is Kesem Frank Aon, co-founder and CEO of MavenNet, uh, doing a lot of work in the enterprise and also blockchain space around the infrastructure, making it really interoperable. And of course, Jenna Pilgrim, co-founder and CEO of a new opportunity called Network Effects. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks for joining us. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks, John. So you guys were just on a panel, uh, the real world applications of blockchain. IBM was on, which has uh, been doing a lot of work right. there. So this is real world, it's low hanging fruit, um, blockchain everyone's pretty excited about, but a lot of people get it and some don't, some are learning. So you got the, the believers, the I want to believe, and then the non-believers. Right. Let's talk about the I want to believe and the believers in blockchain. Some real world applications going on as it's evolving. So there's evolution of the standards, technology, but people are putting it to use. What's going on in the sector around some of the real world cases you guys talked about? I think we're seeing um, a lot of collaboration as, in, as far as, as real world applications go because I think people are sort of starting to, to understand that if a, a distributed network is going to work or is, is going to be secure, it needs diversity and it needs mass scale. So if you know, if lots of different parties can work together, then they can actually form a community that's really working. So as far as real world applications, there's some really interesting ones as far as supply chain. Catherine Harrison at IBM talked about um, their their pilot about uh, shipping, like bringing together um, the, the global supply chain of, of distribution. Um, there's a bunch of in interesting ones about food provenance and, and bringing together different parties just to make sure that, that people know what they're eating and that they are able to, to keep themselves safe. So I think those are two, two definitely interesting ones. Okay, so blo blockchain, supply chain, value chains, these are kind of key words that kind of mean something together. Right. Uh, making things work in a new way, making things more efficient seems to be a trend. You're kind of in that world. Is it efficient? How's the tech working? What are some of the core threshold issues that people have to kind of get so, over? So you know, John, that's exactly the question to ask. A lot of folks out there are looking at blockchain and the promise it kind of represents. And the one big question that keeps echoing over and over and over and is when is this going mainstream? Mm -hmm. When are we going to see something, a domain, a use case that is actually natively on a blockchain? Mm -hmm. um, I think that essentially we kind of owe to ourselves and, and to everyone that cares about this stuff to kind of ask what, what's working today, August 2018, and what is still you know, kind of pending. Um, I co-founded a project called Ann. For us, interoperability is really one of the key facets that you need to be able to solve for to make blockchains real. And, and again, here's the you know, 60 second kind of argument. If you're going to grow all these solutions that are centric around the use case. They do, they solve for different pain points and different stakeholders kind of care about them. They don't really create a cohesive kind of ecosystem until they could all talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And then you have to ask yourself, is the original hypothesis where, you know, it's going to be one mainnet, one chain that's going to rule them all and everybody gets to play on it and everybody deploys their dApps on, on you know, stuff like Fabric or R3 or Ethereum or whatever it might be. And that is absolutely not the way we're seeing enterprise actually kind of shaping into this uh, uh, domain of blockchain. What we're seeing is big consortiums that already have value, tangible today, out of doing stuff on chain. And the biggest thing to solve is how do I take, you know, to Jenna's point around supply chain or food providence, whatever it is, how do I actually open it so I can now start writing insurance events, payment mm -hmm. events, banking, underwriting, auditing, regulation. There is this gigantic ecosystem that needs to be enabled. And again, we are actively saying it's not going to be by an organic model where you and I do everything on top of a single solution. There will be a multitude of solutions mm -hmm. And what we need to solve for is how do we convert them from disparate islands that don't talk to each other into a cohesive ecosystem. This is a great point. Uh, we were talking on our intro and we talked last night on our panel about standards. Mm. If you look at all the major inflection points where wealth was created and value was created around innovation and entrepreneurship and just industry inflection points, there's always some sort of standard 
thing that happened, right. whether it's the OSI model during, during the early days of the internet to you know, certain protocols that made things happen with the internet. Here it's interesting because if you have one chain to rule the wall, it's got to be up and running. Yeah. It's not, there's no one no. thing yet. So no. I see that trend the cloud has, private cloud, public cloud, but public cloud was first, but people had data centers. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So both not compatible, now the trend is multi-cloud. So you can almost connect the dots of saying multi-chain right. might be a big trend. Right. This is kind of what you're kind of teasing out here. That's, that's yeah. exactly what we're about. And I think it's very interesting, the point you're making about the similarities between the two domains. We are you know, in a cloud convention. And, and to me, it means two things. One, we absolutely see the mainstream people, the mainstream players in industry starting to take this seriously. Mm -hmm. It used to be a completely disparate world where you guys are a bunch of crazies with your Bitcoin and Ether and whatnot. <laughs> They're definitely taking this seriously now. The second thing, when you kind of think of cloud as a model, how cloud evolved, it, we used to have these conversations around, you know, are you crazy? You're telling me that my data is not going to be on premise? It's not secure. Now yeah. it's the oh most secure. Oh my God, it's, go it's in the cloud? What's the cloud? <laughs> so you kind of think of, of the progression model that, that was applicable back yeah. then, right? 10 years, 15 years back, where we started privately, and we kind of tell them, okay, we'll take this sidestep of hybrid, and then fully public. Mm -hmm. Took them a while. Took them almost 20 years to get their heads around and it. And there's no one trajectory. What's interesting about blockchain and crypto with token economics, there's no one trend you can map a, uh, an analog to. You can't say, no. this is going to be like this, right. this trend of the past. It's almost developing its own kind of trajectory. A lot of organic community involvement, different tech involvement, totally. different engineering mindsets coming together. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing an engineering-led culture big time mm -hmm. going on. That's propelling it up to the kind of conversations of, let's lay down the pipes, let's start running apps, but I'll do it within a <laughs> two year window. Well, and I think the big thing to, to understand about that is that yes, you need a whole host of developer talent to build distributed systems, but at the end of the day, those systems still have to be used by people. They still have to be used by society. They still, you still have to you know, understand how to, to, to talk to your chief executives about what's happening within your company or what your tech teams are doing. So there's, there's a growing need for, for marketers, for PR people, for people who speak, I don't, you know, don't want to say you know, plain English, but people yeah. who, who understand they how, to the real yeah, world. yeah, they need to translate it, and how to, to bridge the gap between legacy systems, and how do you, how do you take what you were doing before with, and transform it to, to a, a distributed ledger system, how do you do that without just paving the cow path? You know, it's interesting, it's almost intoxicating because you got two elements that get people excited. You got the token economics, which gets right. people go, whoa, mm -hmm. the economics and the liquidity of money and or value creation capture mm -hmm. equations completely changing some of the business model stuff, which can be translated to software and dApps and software in general, software SaaS, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then you got the plumbing or the networking side of it where things like latency, interoperability, absolutely matter. So you, the, with that, all that going on in real time, it's kind of like happening at 30,000 feet and yeah. trying to change the airplane engine out. People are failing, and so there's some false promises. There's also mm -hmm. false hopes that have not been achieved. So yeah. this kind of clouds up the real big picture, which is this is an innovative environment. And so that's we're seeing that trend. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the end of the day, what are people working on, to me, is the tell sign. So, yeah. Kesson, what's your project? Talk about Aon and the work you're doing. Specifically, give some examples of some of the things that you're doing in the trenches. Sure. What's, what are you trying to solve? What are some examples you're running into, and how does that relate to how things might evolve going sure. forward. So, so there is a multitude of different problems that we work on, but if you want to stick just to the fundamentals, let's take one gigantic issue that everyone's kind of tackling from different perspectives. Let's talk about scale. And scale is, especially in blockchains, especially challenging just because of how the technology works. How decentralized could you get before you're, you're faced with gigantic latencies and before you know transaction costs are, are kind of through the roof. And when you think about it, that is all a result of how we kind of contemplate these early stage networks. Mm -hmm. It was always the one network that you know is going to scale to infinity. Absolutely not the way it's going to work out. So from my perspective, again, sticking to this one issue, if you could actually give me a decentralized rail that maintains consensus throughout two networks, I can now actually have two trusted kind of go-tos instead of always putting the full burnt of the throughput on one single network. 
for us, that, that's, a, that's kind of a no-brainer application to interoperability. If you could actually give me all these trusted networks that work in tandem, I could now start splide, uh, splicing mm -hmm. throughputs across many different parallel kind of arrays. Mm -hmm. Not too similar than how do we uh, solve for you know, supercomputing. We understood there is a limit on how fast can a single CPU go, and we started going wide. And that's an interesting point. I wanted to just double click on that for a second, because if you think about it, why would I have multiple rails or multiple systems? Maybe the use cases are different for them. Mm -hmm. Correct. So you don't want to have to pick one cloud or one chain to rule them all, because it's not optimized. We saw that with monolithic systems, and cloud is all about levels of granularity and Correct. microservices and micro everything, right? So Correct. Well, and I would also say that gets into a security issue as well, right? Like, so you have, you're talking about multiple layers, but you also will have multiple layers of permission. You'll have multiple layers of, of how much information someone can see. And what I think is emerging, if, if data is the new oil, then what's emerging is, for the first time, we're now able to trust data that we do not own. And for corporations who say, well, I don't, I don't know how to, to market to you if I don't know everything about you. But in the end, at the end of the day, they want to be able to leverage your data, but they don't need to secure it. Well, I and get, I think that cybersecurity well, issue let's is a talk huge, about, let's, let's, huge I want to get, your, want to get your, both coming. your thoughts on this, because we were talking about this last night, we were riffing on the notion that with cloud, compute and data really drove right. scale. Mm -hmm. So right. Amazon is a great example. And their value now is things like Kinesis and mm -hmm. Aurora, some of their fastest growing services. Right. You got SageMaker, probably will be announced uh, in, at reInvent coming up as the fastest growing service. Mm -hmm. Right now it's Aurora, all data concepts. So the dataization really made cloud mm -hmm. great. True. So okay, let's, what's the analog for crypto and blockchain, tokenization right. is an interesting concept. Right. So mm -hmm. there's a, almost an extension of cloud where you're saying, hey, with tokenization, the tokenization phase, how do you explain that to a common person? You say, is token going to be the token and the money <laughs> aspect of it and the economics, the killer app? Yeah. How's it traverse the infrastructures, yeah. plural? Yeah, or is the wallet going to be the browser? Or is how yeah. how are all of these things happening? How do you make sense of this? What's so, your so, reaction to that trend? So I actually get excited when I think about what token on the most profound level actually means. When you kind of think of where value happens in, in the context of these gigantic enterprises, right? You think of Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, any of them. And you kind of think of what the product is it's all about the data. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how do you convince people to give up data so they can monetize on it. Mm -hmm. And then you have two distinct, like literally gigantic groups of stakeholders at play. You have the users mm -hmm. that essentially get something free, right? So I get to post on Facebook or I get to, I don't know, write an email on Gmail. But then you have the stakeholders that actually extract all that value from my activities. Mm -hmm. A token, I think most profoundly, represents how do we actually get to a unified group where the user himself is the stakeholder that gets to extract the, vet, the data. And again, the, the proposition is pretty straightforward. The more you use the network and the more the network becomes valuable and, and grows, the more valuable the token that drives it is. Yeah. Uh, um, so it changes the value capture correct. Equ equation. Different model, altogether. So the value creators get to capture the value and obviously network effects plays a big part of this, yes. which is your wheel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think it really comes down to, to core principles. So now you're able to, to, to really get down to what Kesson was talking about, about when you're designing a token or if you're yeah. designing an incentive mechanism, you're really going down to the sort of deep game theory of why people do specific things. And if we can financially incentivize people to do good rather than punish them or fine them for doing bad, then we can actually create value for everyone. We're not, you know, we're not, we're designing a new economy that now has the ability to, to propel itself in a fair and prosperous way, if done correctly. I mean, right. obviously that's the, yeah, that's the I, disclaimer I afterwards. I love what you're saying there, because if you look at collective intelligence, a lot of the AI concepts came around from collective intelligence, mm -hmm. predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, all came around using data to create value. Mm -hmm. You go, I always talk about fake news because we are in the, we have a cloud, a media business that's kind of tokenized now, but fake news is not, is two things. It's payload, fake news, the fake mm -hmm. content, mm -hmm. and then the infrastructure dynamics that they arbitraged. Yeah. But network effects. They targeted specific people, mm -hmm. correct. With fake payload, but the distribution was a network effect. Again, this was the perverse incentive that no one was monitoring. There yeah. was no and this Well, and I think in that case, yes, there is news that is inherently false information. But then there's also a whole spectrum of trueness, if you want to call it that. Yeah. So now we have this technology that allows us to overlay on top of that and say, well, what is the provenance of my information? And 
with um, with different layers of, of blockchain systems, you're actually able to, to prove the provenance of your information without exposing yeah. the user's privacy and without exposing the whole supply chain of the media. Because there's like and we you know, believe, media buyers and we And we believe hands. the answer to fake news, frankly, is um, data access, collective mm -hmm. intelligence, mm -hmm. and something like a blockchain where you have incentive systems to filter out the fake mm -hmm. news. Totally. Reputation exactly. systems, these things are not new concepts. It's all about stake at the, at, at the end of the day, right? It's how do you keep a stakeholder accountable for their action? Mm -hmm. You need backing. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think we're definitely on the same page. I love, it's all about fake news all day long, of course we think we're going to solve <laughs> that with our, our CubeCoin token coming out soon. Um, I want to shift gears and talk about some of the, the um, examples we've seen with cloud. Sure. And try to map that to some uh, navigation for people in how to get through the blockchain token world. One of the key things about the cloud was um, something they called shadow IT. Shadow right. IT was people who said, hey, you know what? I can just put my credit card down and actually move this non-core thing out in the cloud mm -hmm. and prove to my boss, show them, not pitch them on the PowerPoint deck, just right. say, yeah. look it, I just did this for that cost in this time frame. Mm -hmm. And that started around 2009, 10 time frame, the early Digirati or the Clouderati kind of did that. But around 2012 it became, wow, the shadow IT is actually R&D practice, mm -hmm. right? So right. you start to see that now. So the question that we see for people evaluating in the enterprise is, how do you judge what's a good project? So certainly people are kicking the tires and doing a little bit, I won't call it shadow IT, but they're, they're taking on some projects as you were talking about in the panel. How should they, in the enterprises in general, large companies, start thinking about how to enable a shadow IT-like right. dynamic? Mm -hmm. And how should they evaluate the kind of projects? Um, I think that's an area people just don't know what to look for. Yeah. Your thoughts? So, so I, I want to add the premise to that because I think that's absolutely the right question to ask. We also need to add the why. Why should we, as people that, that do you know, native cryptocurrencies, should even care about enterprises? Mm -hmm. A lot of people kind of theorized when you know, Bitcoin was created, was you know, to say it was anti-institutional is an understatement, mm -hmm. right? Aren't we meant to kill enterprise? The thing is, I, I, I don't think it's going to be a big bang. I don't think it's going to be, we wake up and you know, nobody's using banking anymore, and nobody's using like, the traditional healthcare, government, and, and you know, whatever, insurance policies. We care about blockchain in the context of enterprise because we think blockchain is a fundamentally better model of doing things. Mm -hmm. It kind of yeah. does away with the black box mm -hmm. where I need to, you know, to be in business with you, I need to blindly trust with you, trust you, and it introduces a much more transparent and, and democratic model of doing things. Mm -hmm. So we absolutely want to introduce and make blockchain mainstream because that's important for us. When you think of how we do it, to your question, Aon is all about interoperability, right? We, we create a solution that helps, helps scale and helps different networks, decentralized networks, communicate to each other. What we also do with Mavenet, the company I run, is essentially make that enterprise friendly. Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard to do adopt, uh, adoption and, and implementation within an enterprise. They're, they're very immune to change. So going the back to- The antibodies, as oh. they say. <laughs> the so, antibodies to innovation, they totally, kill innovation. Yeah. Totally, so, so going back to your original question, it all starts with a PL. Mm -hmm. If somebody is going to authorize you know, an actual production system in, in an enterprise for blockchain, it needs to create a tangible value, a tangible return quickly, yeah. and that's the mm -hmm. key. So with the model that, that actually scales is you start by flushing out inefficiency plate. Thank you God, show yeah. the enterprise Thank how you, you right. could actually achieve, I don't know, 20%, 30%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the order of magnitude that they care about efficiency by, by moving some part of your value chain on top of the And blockchain. it has to have an order of magnitude Total. Uh, difference. So, so th it's, it's really, I mean, Cloud is, was a great example too. It changes the operating model. Yeah. They achieve what they wanted to achieve faster and more efficiently and operated it differently. Correct. And people were staring at it like a three-headed monster, like what is this <laughs> thing, right, the cloud thing? And throwing you know, all kinds of FUD out there. But ultimately in the day, it's a new operating model for the same thing that they're trying to do with the old stuff. Mm -hmm. I well, mean, it's almost that I simple. Yeah, I think in some cases it's, you need to really, uh, in, in my, my previous life at the, the Blockchain Research Institute, we encouraged a lot of our clients to, to really take a step back and say, well, will I actually, A, will I have this problem in eight years or seven years or 20 years or 50 years? If we're really fundamentally building a new financial system or a new way of doing things that is fundamentally different, are we 
building it all on old yeah. technology. We need to make sure that, the, and that's why that's why you've seen banks were the first in the door to say, yeah, payments, that sounds great, that sounds great. But yeah. the real applications that we're seeing from banks are in loyalty, they're in um, AY, uh, uh, AML and KYC, they're in, they're in the f sort of fringe operations. And something like payments is going to take a really long time to, to push through because of that, those legacy systems, because that yeah. payments is the fundamentals of what banks do. This is an interesting point. I want to get your thoughts to end the segment because I think one of the things that we've certainly seen with cloud uh, over the generational shifts right. that have happened, the time frame for innovation is getting shorter and shorter. Mm -hmm. So time frame is critical. So if the communities are fumbling mm -hmm. around hitting that time to value, it's got to be. It's, it seems to be trending to faster. And we don't want to hear slower, because these systems are inadequate, they're antiquated, mm -hmm. these are the systems that are disrupted. So the timing of whether it's standards or interoperability yeah. or business models, right. operating models, they got to be faster. Yeah. That's the table stakes. I think it all comes down to collaborative governance. People have to figure out blockchain faster. Yeah. What's holding us back? What's, or what's accelerating us? What's the key for the community at large, that from the engineering community and the business community, to make it go faster? Your right. thoughts. So I, I think, we're still searching for the next killer app. If Bitcoin is the reason we're all sitting here today, and I profoundly believe that, yeah. what is the next thing that drives change on a global scale? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're trying collectively as an industry to figure out. And sure, many kind of roadblocks on the way, some of them educational, perceptional, regulation, technology, but the next big wave yeah. that's going to accelerate us to, to the next 10 years of blockchain is, is that next killer app. Yeah. And, and you know, organizations such as myself, Jenna, that's, that's our day job. We wake yeah. up and that's what it. we do. Yeah, I mean, I've always said, and Dr. Wong, who's the founder of Alibaba Cloud, agreed with me. I've been saying that the TCP IP protocol, that standard really enabled a lot of interoperability and created lots of diverse value up the stack. So the OSI mm -hmm. model, Open Systems Interconnect, right. seven layer model, actually never got standardized. It mm -hmm. kind of stopped at TCP IP, and that was good. Everyone snapped into line. That created mm -hmm. massive value. But that's, right. a collaborative, value. that's a collaborative governance thing. That's people coming together and saying that these are the standards that we wish to adhere to. We and need so, that moment right yeah, now. Yeah, so you see organizations like the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance coming out yeah. with a, you know, a, a prospective list of standards that they think the community should adhere to. You know, you have yeah. the ERC20 standard, you have all these yeah. different organizations, you know, the World Economic Forum is playing a role in that, and you know, the UN is playing a role, especially when it comes to identity and, yeah. and, and um, those kind of really big societal issues. But I yeah. think that it comes down to that everyone plays a role, that I'm, do, yeah. I'm doing my best, I think it's going to be somewhere in the realm of data, so that's where I've chosen to sort of I think this is a good conversation course, to have, and I think we can continue with it. I mean, I, I read on Medium, just everyone's reading these fat protocols, thin protocols, right. but at the end of the day, what does that matter if there's no like, scale? Yeah. You can have all the fat protocols you want, yeah. more of a land <laughs> grab, I would say, but you know, certainly models, but is that subordinate, or is that is it the cart before the horse? This is the conversation that I think is, mm -hmm. is in the hallways. Totally yeah. agreed. Totally yeah. agreed. Guys, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Breaking down real world applications of blockchain, we're at the Global Cloud and Blockchain Summit. It's an inaugural event, and I think this is going to be the kind of format we're going to see more of, cloud and blockchain coming together. Collision course, or is it going to come in nicely and land together and, and work together? We'll see. Of course, theCUBE's covering it. Thanks for watching. Stay with us for more all day coverage. Part of the Futurist Conference coming up in the next two days. We're in Toronto. We'll be back with more after this short break.